Thank you for the very kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. This has been an absolutely wonderful meeting. I have learned a great deal. I should say uh, that I am not um, an engineer. Uh, and so I feel as if I'm here under slightly false pretenses in some sense. What I will talk about though is natural selection because natural selection is a great engineer. Um, but we heard yesterday from Francis that there are areas of biology that enzymes don't seem to have gone into. It's not that they can't do it, they can do it perfectly well. Um, it's just that there isn't an incentive somehow for them to do it. And we see the same thing with cells and with life generally. There are whole areas that life has just not gone into. And, and that's, um, the reasons for that are, I, I find fascinating. So I'm going to talk today about the origin of the eukaryotic cell. So the eukaryotic cell are the large complex cells with a nucleus, so eukaryote just means true nucleus, where we have all of our DNA. And so everything you can see, really, which is to say plants and animals and fungi and so on, they're all composed of these eukaryotic cells. Um, this is not working. Okay, I shall just use this. So this is a, a three domains tree of life that I suspect a lot of you here will be familiar with. Um, this goes back to Carl Woese in, in 1990, um, and there, a lot of people still are taught today about the five kingdoms. Actually, let's just have a quick show of hands from the, from the high school kids here. How many people have heard about the three domains, and how, pe how many people... Yeah. Okay. And how many people are, are familiar with the five kingdoms or the six kingdoms of life? Okay, that's, that's great. So I can tell you for nothing that education in Sweden is way better than education in the UK because I've asked this question of UK audiences and very few people uh, have really got beyond the five or six kingdoms. So the three domains, um, they go back to the, the bacteria, the archaea, so they look the same. This is the key point. We've known about some archaea, in fact, for hundreds of years. Um, the methanogens, for example, we've been familiar with them for 400 years. Um, but they look the same as bacteria in their appearance. And so Carl Woese uh, first started sequencing RNA uh, and, 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 and came up with this genetic tree of life. Uh, and the branch lengths here then give an indication of the amount of variation within these groups. And so it was a bit shocking because the animals, the fungi, the plants were just stuffed across in this small corner of the tree of life. This was a Copernican revolution in biology because, again, it pushes us into a small inconsequential corner of the universe, even of life. And it's difficult to accept, but it's true. Um, but it's also difficult, I find it's difficult sometimes to see things, and this is one of the reasons why I enjoy writing books, because that's how I come to understand the world. I try and ex explain, why is the tree of life like this? Um, and it's, you don't ask, I didn't ask myself these questions, there's a couple of very strange things about this tree of life. Why is there so much genetic variation within these two groups? They're very different to each other. They're different in the biochemistry. And all of these metabolic pathways that we've just been hearing about, they are very different, shockingly different. But in their morphology, they're the same. They've had four billion years of evolution to come up with anything. In their biochemistry, they are far more sophisticated than the complex eukaryotic cells over here. They can do anything except become large and big and complex. Why didn't they do that? So what was happening down here that wasn't happening in those groups? And it becomes even more strange because it's not just at the level of large plants and animals, it's at the level of single cells. So this is uh, euglena. It's, it's basically it's, it's the kind of scum that you find on any pond. Um, here is one of the more complex bacteria that you'll find. This is planktomycetes. You might just be able to see that it's got a, a, a little... Um, looks a little bit like a nucleus. It's a kind of compartment where the DNA is. It's not very much like a nucleus, but this is one of the reasons we consider it to be quite complex. Perhaps this is a first step towards making a nucleus. But you can see, the reason you can't see it very well is it's roughly to scale. This is just enormously larger. On average, eukaryotic cells are about 15,000 times bigger than, than bacteria in their volume. And you don't need to know what these are. These are actually chloroplasts in the case of Eudelina. Here's the nucleus. You can just make out the mitochondria. But you don't need to know what this stuff is inside a cell to appreciate that we've gone up orders of magnitude in complexity from what the bacteria and the archaea have done. And it's a puzzle. And we don't know the answer to that puzzle. Um, 
Also, at the level of eukaryotic cells, again, just to make you feel even more inconsequential, this is, uh, this is paramecium, and this is a pancreatic acinar cell. Let's just, uh, again, uh, curious to know, how many genes do you think paramecium has? When I say genes, I mean genes coding for proteins. Any, any suggestions for how many genes paramecium has? I've had answers between 50 and <laughs> a few thousand. How many do you think? Okay, well, I'll tell you, the answer is 40,000. So that's twice as many as we have. Um, these are complex cells, so, uh, uh, but single-celled organisms. The reason they have so many genes is they do an awful lot of stuff inside that single cell. Um, so the level of complexity between different types of eukaryotic cell is very equivalent. We are really not very much more sophisticated than a paramecium but we're an awful lot more sophisticated than a bacterium in terms of the morphological complexity. So what's going on? There's really no agreement, so I, I, I'm confident in standing up here and talking to you that whatever I say may be right or may be wrong, but you'll never really know. <laughs> so um, I, can really, I, 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 can, I think we can try and get at the problem, but we don't know the answer. These are some of the really, the, the, the great thinkers of biology over the 20th century. So, Jacques Monod, we heard from yesterday, uh, we, we heard about yesterday, uh, one of the pioneers of molecular biology. He wrote this wonderful book called Chance and Necessity uh, in 1970. Um, and it, it, it's got quite a bleak existential view. It's, a, it's an extremely exciting read, but he sees the origins of life as being... Uh, really very, very difficult and unlikely to happen again. One of the reasons that perhaps we don't see life elsewhere is that the origin of life is so difficult. That's what he thought. I don't think uh, that, that, that the other people in the room would necessarily think that way. Um, but again, once evolution's got going, what happens? Stephen Jay Gould wrote a great book called Wonderful Life that he imagined rolling back the clock back to the time of the Cambrian explosion when the first animals appeared in the fossil record, and then let it play forward again. Would we end up with humans? Would we end up with uh, you know, even vertebrates? Or would we end up with perhaps giant octopuses kind of on the hills or something? It's very hard to know what you might imagine. The question is, what kind of engineering principles guide the evolution of life? So on this side, these, these two basically think that there's a great deal of contingency that the environment affects what happens, that the asteroid that wipes out the dinosaurs uh, gives the mammals a chance. That would never have happened if that asteroid hadn't hit in that particular place. In fact, it seems perhaps vaporizing um, sulfur into the atmosphere, sulfates into the atmosphere, if it hadn't hit specifically there in the Yucatan Peninsula. Christian de Duve, another Nobel laureate, Simon Conway Morris really believed far more in the engineering principles that underpin selection, that you will get the same things emerging time and time again because that's the best way to do it. If you want to fly, you better have something like wings. You better be aerodynamic. You're going to find wings arising in bats, in birds, in insects with a rather similar structure, with rather similar aerodynamic properties for the same reasons. And so they would argue that we would end up with something rather like the world that we have at the moment, if you were to wind back the clock to the origin of life and let it play forward again? The simple answer is we don't know who is right. This, I think, is the key problem, and I've already alluded to this. If we go back nearly four billion years, so the kind of timeline that Jerry Joyce was talking about in the, in the last talk, 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago, we see fossils in rocks that look a lot like bacteria. So, we don't know for sure if they are. Natural processes can give rise to shapes in rocks that look an awful lot similar to bacteria, but the best of our knowledge, we see bacteria going back 3.8 billion years. A recent paper from colleagues of mine at UCL said 4 billion years. I'm not sure if they're right, but <laughs> Jerry's shaking his head here. He's not sure if they're right either. But look what happened afterwards. They flatlined for practically three and a half billion years. What was going on, in the, or what was not going on in the bacteria? Why is it that only once in that entire period do we see the origin of complex life? Now, we know it happened once because all of these eukaryotic cells are related to each other. We share a tremendous number of traits in common. We all have a nucleus. We all have straight chromosomes. We all have genes in pieces with 
non-coding introns and then bits that code for proteins. We all have the same structures inside cells. We all have mitochondria, and I'll say more about that. So we know that we all share a common ancestor, and by definition that arose once, but if we look in the fossil record to see things that were not eukaryotic, other origins, alternative origins of complex life, we don't see it there. We look around the world, we trawl through all kinds of muds in, in strange environments, and we look to see alternative forms of life, and we don't really find it. We find new archaea, we find new bacteria, we find amazing things, but we're not really finding different structures to cells. It's what I like to think, this is a, a, one of the great evolutionary biologists, and he was at UCL for a, a period, John Maynard Smith, and he used to look for what he called the scandals in evolution, the things that really ought not to be happening like that. They should have done something different. Why, why did it go this way rather than that way? And this is an evolutionary scandal on, on, on his kind of terms. So all complex life is composed of eukaryotic cells. They only arose once, and we all share these, not just the physical structure of the cells, but we're all sexual. Plants are sexual, but you know, yeast is sexual too. It, it's right across the entire tree of, of eukaryotes. Not just sexual, but they, you know, the, the, the gametes fuse together and they go through a two-step meiosis using the same proteins. We can find the same genes right across the whole tree. It's the same. Um, so why? Bacteria don't evolve any of these complex traits. They do some homologous recombination and lateral gene transfer, but they don't do two-step meiosis and they don't recombine across the entire genome. So it's a very different process that they do. So the scandal is, if all of these traits evolve step by step by natural selection, and each step offers some small advantage, and there's no reason to disbelieve any of that, then why is it that none of these traits arose in bacteria? It ought to be like the eye. So eyes arose, essentially independently, on at least 60 or 70 different occasions in different, in different environments. A lot of these are um, animal eyes. And so they actually do go back to a common ancestor that was a light-sensitive spot on some kind of a worm. And there are some regulatory genes that they have in common, the Pax 6 gene, for example. But independently, those regulatory genes recruited all the rest of the genes required to make an eye. And, and so the octopus eye, which is here, and the human eye, they're very fine examples of convergent evolution. They're structured in essentially the same way, but they evolved independently. This is um, Eudelina again. Here's the eye spot in Eudelina. It uses essentially the same um, rhodopsins that we use in our own eyes. Uh, and, and this is even more strange. This is a single-celled uh, protist. Um, and, and so it's got a retina here, and it's got a lens, um, it's got a cornea, the, 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 the retina is made of chloroplasts. <laughs> the, 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 the cornea is made of mitochondria. Um, it's just recruited various different parts. It's got the same structure as the kind of eye that we're familiar with, but it's an utterly independent origin. It's convergent evolution. So that's what selection would predict, that we should see multiple origins of rather similar functioning things. They're different to each other in different environments, different ecosystems, and that's what we would expect. So why don't we see multiple origins of a nucleus, if it's a good thing to have, or sex, if it's good to have sex? Or phagocytosis, the ability to go around and engulf other cells, that's, that's essentially eating. That's, but we never see that in bacteria. Well, here is uh, a way of getting at the problem. This is a more recent tree. Um, it's actually a few years old now, but I like this one. This is just the eukaryote. So, uh, and, and, and again, forget about plants and algae as the main groups. There are five or six supergroups of eukaryotes. So there's the rhizaria, the excavates, the chromalvulates, the unicons. We are all unicons. Uh, I rather like the term, although it's now becoming slightly old, outmoded, but we are all unicons. Uh, so there we are, the metazoans and the, and the fungi. The reason I like this tree is right at the center, this is the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. And it's rather symbolically a black hole. So there's two things to take, take away from this. There's far more variation within these groups than there is between the ancestors of those groups. So this is a, what's called a Big Bang radiation. It happens apparently rather abruptly. And that common ancestor had everything. It was a recognizable eukaryotic cell. We can trace all of the genomes of a, 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 a large number in these different groups, and we can see that they share an awful lot, including all these traits that I've been talking about. So we know that common ancestor had all of those things, 
but we don't know how they arose. All we know is that bacteria don't have them. So this is the, what I like to think of as the black hole at the heart of biology. We do not know how or why complex cells arose from bacteria. So I will put some ideas forward. We, I mean, uh, these are not by any means the only ideas, but uh, we, don't, we don't have facts to prove it yet. It looks like some kind of a bottleneck. It looks as if perhaps the conditions changed, and the reason that eukaryotes suddenly took over the world is perhaps there'd been a snowball Earth. We know there was a snowball Earth about 2.3 billion years ago, and another one around 700 million years ago. This is when the entire planet froze over, we think, the geologists tell us, right down to sea level on the equator. So, you know, catastrophic global changes are undoubtedly bottlenecks that could affect uh, tremendously the whole trajectory of life. Um, this is another one, the great oxidation event, when we first start to see oxygen in the atmosphere, again, from about 2.2, 2.3 billion years ago, probably linked, in fact, with that earlier snowball Earth. So these are global catastrophes that it's very easy to imagine that after this catastrophe, just like the mammals expanded after the dinosaurs, the eukaryotic cells expanded. Um, but that makes some predictions. And, and people have been a little sloppy in the way that we've thought about these predictions, I think. What you might imagine, if it was oxygen, for example, suddenly allowing the freedom to become bigger and more complex, because now there's oxygen that we can respire and that plants respire and so on, you would expect multiple origins, nonetheless. You would expect that the, the, the cyanobacteria, the photosynthetic bacteria, would give rise to photosynthetic plants and algae. You would expect that osmotrophic bacteria would give rise to the fungi, so putting enzymes out into the surrounding area, breaking down the food, and then taking up the, 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 the monomers. You would expect separate origins from the ones which are best pre-adapted to the new conditions, but that's not what we see. The, the serial endosymbiosis theory from, from Lynn Margulis, again, she anticipated um, that there would be multiple different types of endosymbiosis, different types of bacteria interacting with each other, and essentially multiple different origins of complex life. But that's not what we see. What we seem to see is something more like this. Uh, and I shall say more about this. It looks like not an environmental bottleneck, but actually a structural bottleneck, something to do with the structure of cells. And, and one cell got inside another one, and then this is the black hole area where everything evolved, and then this is the moment where, where everything takes off into the modern groups that we see. This is the acquisition of the chloroplasts here, so uh, the cyanobacteria that gave rise to the algae. They didn't change the fundamental uh, direction of evolution. Um, but here is what I shall talk about for the remainder of the talk. So, the one thing which has really changed over the last 20 years, and again, this is grounded in medical research because most of these, in fact, are parasites of one sort or another, it was thought that, well, none of them have mitochondria, and, and they all look rather morphologically primitive. The assumption was that um, these were early branching eukaryotes that would give us an indication of how complex life arose. Well, it turns out, after a lot of studying, that they all do have mitochondria, just not as we know them. They've become what are called relic organelles, or they've even lost them altogether in the case of monocircomonoides, but they all had them once, and they became specialized for different tasks. Um, so we now know that that common ancestor already had mitochondria. And when we start looking at the, the genomes, then we can see that, um, that, that potentially the origin of eukaryotes and the acquisition of mitochondria were one and the same thing. So the mitochondria, in case you don't know, they are the powerhouses of eukaryotic cells. So these are our own mitochondria here. Um, and what's going on, this was uh, discovered back in 1961 by Peter Mitchell, uh, who called it chemiosmotic coupling. Um, and, and this is Peter Mitchell in, in 1947, in fact, with Jennifer Moyle, his uh, long-term collaborator all their lives, really. He won the Nobel Prize in 1978 um, for his visionary ideas. Jennifer Moyle had been the experimentalist, really, who tested all these ideas and showed that, um, that it was essentially true, that this is really how cells work. It's interesting to me, uh, perhaps in this arena especially, to, to wonder about how one balances between the ideas and the experiments. I think it, it was correct that Mitchell got the Nobel Prize by himself because he had the, the ideas by himself, but he didn't do the experiments. If Jennifer Moyle had not done those experiments, nothing would have proved Mitchell to be correct, and, and so I, perhaps they deserved it together. I don't know. Um, so, this is what he showed. So this is what's happening in you right now. 
uh, electrons are being stripped from food. Um, and they're being passed down. This is the membrane here. So these are these membranes in here. These are giant protein complexes that I'm just symbolizing as small balloons. What we have is a current of electrons uh, from food to oxygen. And that current of electrons is powering the extrusion of protons across the membrane. So we end up with a kind of reservoir of protons uh, on this side of the membrane and relatively few on that side. Protons have a positive charge, which means you, you now have an electrical potential across this membrane. But there's also a concentration difference. So it's what Peter Mitchell called the proton motive force. And this, the ATP synthase, which is a wonderful machine, um, it's a rotating motor. Uh, it's essentially really um, equivalent to uh, a, 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 a hydroelectric dam, and this is the, the turbine in a hydroelectric dam. So this is equivalent to water flowing through the turbine. It's the protons which are flowing through the ATP synthase, which are turning the motor, which is powering uh, the synthesis of ATP, and that's powering everything else in the cell. So this is what's happening in respiration. Now, the mitochondria were bacteria once. We're pretty certain about that. In fact, there's not really any serious opposition to that idea anymore. That goes back to Lynn Margulis. Right, it goes back much before Lynn Margulis, but she was the person who nailed the idea. In 1967, 50 years ago uh, this year, there's a celebratory issue uh, of the Journal of Theoretical Biology where she published that original paper coming out shortly. Um, she, incidentally, married Carl Sagan. Uh, so they must have had some pretty amazing breakfast time conversations, I should imagine, in that household. They unfortunately divorced um, before 1967, when she pu first published that, that paper. But the key point is that mitochondria were bacteria once, uh, and that's firmly established. This is an alternative tree of life going back to 1990, the same time as Carl Woese, and this is a different way of seeing it. This is Jim Lake. So this is the Carl Woese tree of life, the three domains tree of life. And Jim Lake said, oh, no, it's not, it's a ring. In fact, he sent a paper to Nature, which he entitled, One Ring to Rule Them All. And um, they rejected the title, unfortunately. They published his paper, uh, and this was the essence of it. He was looking at where these genes came from. And a large number come from bacteria, a large number come from archaea, and it's this which is giving rise to the eukaryotes. This was a radical idea that nobody really believed for quite a long time. But over the last maybe six or seven years, it's become clear from phylogenetics that something like this is indeed the case. So this is the classic three domains tree with the eukaryotes at the top. These are different groups of archaea here and the bacteria down at the bottom. That's the classic tree. What we see now, look, the eukaryotes are inside all these archaea. This is from concatenated sequences of 40 to 60 genes. The, the more genes you have, the bigger the signal, and the, so the, the, the stronger the signal. The trouble is the more genes you have, the more likely to be passed around by lateral gene transfer they have, and that produces noise, which clouds the signal. So it's a difficult balance to find, uh, but this has been repeatedly found in, in a lot of studies now. That means the host cell was an archaeon. Uh, we don't know what kind of archaeon, but we're getting closer. This is a paper from earlier this year and, and, and some earlier work from a couple of years ago. Um, this is the Asgard superphylum. So the Loki archaeota were discovered at Loki's castle a couple of years ago. We don't know what they look like. This is just metagenomic screening of the muds around there. Uh, and these are the most similar genomes to the eukaryotes. Here are the eukaryotes branching. There's now several groups. So we have the Loki archaeota, but also the Odin archaeota, the Thor archaeota, the Heimdall archaeota. We've got all these Norwegian gods down there now. Um, Norse gods, or maybe they're Swedish gods, I suppose they're just <laughs> Nordic gods, I should say here. Um, so, we don't know what any of these look like. We only have the genome sequences, and they're all relatively small. They're all 4,000, 5,000 genes or so. So, they're kind of standard size for archaeal genomes. Um, and they have some interesting properties. They seem to have a, a, a pretty dynamic cytoskeleton compared to other archaea. They seem to uh, be capable of some membrane remodeling, but we haven't seen it. We don't really know, are they slightly phagocytic? Can they begin to engulf other cells? Or is it just how they divide in half, where you also need to change the membrane structures? So we don't know yet what kind of an archaeon, but we're fairly sure that we have something here, um, this something to do with the Asgard phyla, the Loki archaeota, um, acquires a bacterium. And this is where it becomes really quite difficult. And I'd just like to show you, this is a paper from last year from Nature, um, which gives an indication of how difficult it is to get at some of these problems. So what this is looking at is the stem length of genes that come from bacteria. So there's a lot of genes that come from bacteria. Some of them 
branch with the alpha proteobacteria. The, these are definitely the mitochondrial genes. So here are the genes that are definitely with the mitochondria. But these genes, they, 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 they will branch with bacteria, but not clearly with any particular group. And the stem length is longer, which means to say there are more differences. So what they interpreted this as was, um, so this structure this is the nucleus, these are bacterial genes that you find in the nucleus are more distantly related. Um, these are the endomembrane systems, these are the mitochondria. So what they said from this is that the number of differences represent time, roughly, and that's a general agreed with any, um, with, with any kind of molecular clock. There's an assumption that the number of differences accumulating over time gives an indication of the time that passed. And if that's the case, then the nucleolus, the nucleus, the endomembrane systems all arose before the acquisition of mitochondria. And if this is correct, then everything I'm going to tell you in the rest of the talk is incorrect. Uh, and so this is the kind of things that trouble you uh, when you're trying to sleep at night. Are they right? Have I been wasting my time for the last 10 years? Well, they may be correct. I don't know. They may also be wrong. The question is, do I have an answer to why they would see that? I assume their data is correct. Um, so do I have an answer? Well, yes, I do. And I don't know if my answer is correct, but it, it helps me to sleep. So <laughs> this is... This is an old tree going back now to 1998. And uh, there's the bacteria, the archaea. And these groups, these are the cells that I showed you before, the archaezoa. These are cells that don't have mitochondria. We thought that they were early branching. Why? Well, they, they're simple, simple in their morphology, but also they have these long, long branch lengths. And that means that they, they branch on a tree because of, a, of an artifact known as long branch attraction. They're shown to branch here. And here was the acquisition of mitochondria. Actually, they're up here somewhere. So, is that the length of these branches does not give an indication of the amount of time. It gives you an indication of the amount of evolution that has happened, the number of changes. And we can't constrain the time necessarily with that. So these, this is an artifact, and everybody's agreed about that now. And so I think this is probably the best way to think about that other study. As, as I in insist, I may not be right at all. Whoops. This is, uh, this is a painting by Audre Noel, a beautiful painting of a eukaryotic cell. Uh, and so here's the nucleus, here are the mitochondria, here are these endomembrane systems that I was talking about. Why would you have more evolution in the endomembranes or the nucleus? Well, the genes in the mitochondria are doing what they always did. They're doing respiration in the mitochondrial setting. They are under strong purifying selection for the same job in the same setting that they always did. It never changed. And the purifying selection means that you have fewer changes in sequence because changes get eliminated because they're not helpful to you. Um, but the endomembrane, well, they don't exist in bacteria, really. In the nucleus, it doesn't exist in bacteria. So there must have been, theoretically, there must have been a period of strong adaptive selection. And adaptive selection, by its nature, is forcing changes on you. You're changing to a new purpose, a new function. Uh, and so you're going to have lots of changes. And that's going to increase the branch length. So this is how I can sleep. I think it can be interpreted in that way, if I may be right, may be wrong. If I'm right, what does it, what does it say? Well. This is the origin of the eukaryotic cell, if this is the case. These are bacteria living inside a bacterial cell. And this is the only example that we know of, of bacteria inside a bacterial cell. There's plenty of bacteria inside eukaryotic cells, which are large and complex, and then golf cells like bacteria for a living. But bacteria don't do that. This is a cyanobacteria. These are the thylakoid membranes. It has a cell wall. It did not engulf those cells. We don't know how they got there. But what good is it? If those cells inside went on to become the mitochondria, then the question really is, why was the acquisition of mitochondria any use? And, in, and, and it seems reasonable that we should look for the answer in terms of energy in one way or another. What they, they are the power packs, they produce the ATP, so that's where we should look for an answer. But if we look, this is a values taken from the literature, this is the metabolic rate of bacteria compared to single-celled protists. This is a log scale in each case, so bacteria respire about three times faster than single-celled eukaryotes. So it's not just a case of uh, they help us to respire faster. It's not as simple as that. But that's per gram. If we look per cell, it changes around. So this is, again, it's a log scale. So eukaryotic cells consume about 5,000 times more oxygen per minute than a single bacterial cell. Why? Because they're 15,000 times larger. Of course they do. They're juggernauts. So it's a silly comparison in one sense but it's beginning to get at the, at the problem. What are they spending it all on? Well, this is per megabase of DNA, and you can see it's roughly similar again in this case. So eukaryotic cells have become a lot larger. They have a lot more 
energy, in effect, and they're spending it on maintaining a much larger genome. But they're not really spending any more per megabase of DNA than, than a bacterium does. What are they actually spending it on? Well, this is uh, some, some old work. Um, this is not the kind of thing that many people think about anymore, but Frank Harrell did some lovely work in the 1970s on uh, and, and um, what, are, what is the ATP budget of bacteria or, or yeast or something? Um, and the answer is, to a large degree, protein synthesis. That's not true of us. That's not true of multicellular organisms generally. Um, but it's, it seems to be true of, uh, of, of, many, of many protists and of bacteria that 75 to 80 percent of the energy budget of a cell goes on protein synthesis. Here's DNA synthesis. It's a trivial cost in comparison. There can be lots of futile cycling going on in an environment, but this is in growing cells, and when they're growing, the biggest costs are to do with, with protein synthesis. So if we then look at the energy availability per protein coding gene, and we equalize uh, for uh, bacteria and for eukaryotes in the, in the number of genes, then we find, again, a roughly 5,000-fold difference. So eukaryotes have about 5,000 times more energy per gene than a single bacterial cell. That does not mean that they should have 5,000 more genes. It means that they can do 5,000 times as much gene expression. They can make 5,000 times as many proteins. And because they're 15,000 times larger, of course, they have to. So it's a statement of the obvious, really. So we need to correct for cell volume as well. If we correct for cell volume, then we get this massive silly difference. This opens up to a 200,000-fold difference in energy per gene when we've corrected for the gene number and cell volume. Now, I say it's silly because we've made a silly assumption underpinning it, but it's interesting to get at why it's a silly assumption. So bacteria, they're pumping protons in exactly the same way that our mitochondria do. They're pumping them across the plasma membrane. And if you increase the, the, the volume of the cell, then, of course, you have surface area to volume constraints. The ATP synthesis depends on the surface area. The protein synthesis depends on the volume. Uh, and so that's where that number of 200,000 came from, and it's a silly number, because we know that bacteria can internalize membranes and get around that problem immediately. So why don't they actually do that, or do they do that? Well, to an extent, they do. And this is, uh, this is a, another paper which causes me uh, trouble sleeping at night. This is from Mike Lynch. Um, and what he's got here is this is the, the ATP synthesis uh, complexes, so the number of ATPase enzymes uh, against the surface area. And you see a nice straight line, bacteria down here, eukaryotes up there. So it basically correlates beautifully with surface area, is what you would expect. You have more surface area, you have more energy, more ATPase enzymes. And this is the number of ribosomes in a cell. Um, against the cell volume. Again, the bigger the cell, the more ribosomes. He would say that these are just too continuous and really, you know, there's nothing special about eukaryotes. But what's concealed here in these log scales is that all the bacteria are down here in each case. We've got one, one eukaryote there, but by and large, all the eukaryotes are up here, all the bacteria down there, and there's a couple of orders of magnitude difference between the largest bacteria and the smallest archaea. There's overlap. But I would say these are two different continua, and there's something else which is stopping bacteria from expanding its surface area across eukaryotic proportions. So these are bacteria, uh, cyanobacteria, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and these are the internal membranes in them, so they can do it perfectly easily. And this is paramecium again, and these are the mitochondria in paramecium. And the difference is scale again. So these are roughly to scale. And this is only a small section of a paramecium. It's expanded up over orders of magnitude. The difference here is that these mitochondria all have genes of their own. They've all, they started out as bacteria. They lost most of their genes. But they ended up retaining always a very similar subset of genes. And they seem to need those genes to control respiration. And so here we're beginning to converge on engineering principles in one sense. You need genes to control respiration. If you want to get bigger, um, then you just have more mitochondria but each one comes with its own regulatory system in, 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 these, in these genes. So if they want to expand up to a eukaryotic size, well, perhaps they can't. Well, it's easily tested because there are some giant bacteria around. So this is E. coli here. Here's paramecium. So paramecium is dwarfed by this battleship of a cell. This is a polypiscium. It's a bacterial cell, and you can see it with the naked eye. This is even larger. This is thia margarita. Uh, it's basically a giant vacuole. Um, with a thin film of cytoplasm surrounding it. This is a single bacterial cell, and this is Drosophila, the fruit fly. So it's almost as big as the head of Drosophila. So this really is a monstrous cell. 
So if you need genes to control respiration, and this, and this is cell is respiring across this plasma membrane, then there better be a lot of genes there, otherwise these ideas are just wrong. Well, this is known as extreme polyploidy. This is a polypiscium, this is DAPI staining, and these are copies of the complete genome. When I first saw this picture, I realized that maybe there's something in what we were talking about. There are 200,000 copies of the complete genome. Each genome is three megabases of DNA, so three million base pairs. Uh, and this is Thea Margarita. This is the giant vacuole. This is a thin film of cytoplasm. And here there's about 15 to 20,000 copies of the complete genome. When you add up all of that genomic weight, and you say, what's the energy available per gene, per haploid copy of each gene, this is E. coli, Thea Margarita, a polypiscium, is essentially the same. What they are is like kind of a consortium of bacteria that are fused together, and each genome is controlling a similar volume of cytoplasm and a similar area of, uh, of plasma membrane, and, and that's how it works. So they have other advantages to being larger, but it's not nothing to do with energy. So uh, why then are eukaryotes different? Why is this an advantage? Well, these went on to become the mitochondria, and the difference is they are not genomes. They are bacteria. They are autonomous, self-replicating cells in populations capable of undergoing selection and change over time, and that's exactly what happened. So what does happen in bacteria generally? Well, this is, in front of this here, the yellow one here is a cell that lost a gene that it doesn't need. Let's say it's for respiring with lactose or something like that. It doesn't need that gene, and if it loses it, it cuts out a bit of DNA, it will grow a little bit faster, and there's plenty of evidence showing that, that gene loss is an important factor in bacterial evolution. And over time, most of the cells in that population will have lost that bit of DNA that they don't really need because they, 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 they can grow slightly faster. But then the conditions change. Suddenly, everything's swamped with lactose again, and, uh, and they need it again. So what do they do? Well, they pick up random bits of DNA from the environment, and, and one of them happens to contain that gene, and before you know it, you're back where you started. And so we have kind of dual selection pressures. One is to lose as many genes as you can afford to lose, and the other is to pick them up whenever you need them, uh, bilateral gene transfer. But here, imagine the same thing happening inside a cell, and let's say this cell loses the genes required for making a cell wall. And you don't need a cell wall if you're living inside another cell. You're in a, in a fairly fixed homeostatic environment. So it takes over, and all the cells in that population lose that gene. Perhaps the genes for a bacterial flagellum and so on as well. You don't need those genes anymore, so you lose them, and the conditions never change. If, so long as the host cell survives, the conditions don't change, and you do fine. And this is a trajectory which is really common in bacteria. So this is typhus, which is a, a nice example. Typhus obliterated the, uh, the Napoleonic armies. This is the retreat of Napoleon from Moscow. Um, and it, it's, basically, it's an intracellular bacterium. This is rickettsia, which is the cause of typhus. So it's transmitted uh, by, the, by the flea. Um, and it's lost most of its genes. It's down around about one megabase of DNA, so about a quarter of the size of E. coli or something. And that's really common. This is the range of genome sizes of free living bacteria, and now it goes up to about 12 or 13 megabases. Again, there is a, there is a continuum with eukaryotes, but eukaryotes go up to 150,000 megabases, so orders of magnitude more. And the obligate symbionts and endosymbionts are down here, one megabase or less. And we know hundreds of examples of bacterial cells living inside eukaryotes, and all of them have undergone this genomic streamlining. So, why is that useful? Well, it's useful because the bacteria still make as much ATP as they ever did. It's just that their overhead costs are being constantly uh, lowered. So if you imagine that you've got 100 endosymbionts, this is a silly thought experiment, but it gives, a, it gives an indication of the size of the advantage. So imagine you've got 100 endosymbionts, 100 bacteria living inside this cell. Each of them have a standard bacterial size genome of four megabases, so about 4,000 genes. And let's assume that they lose 200 of these genes that they don't need. So what are the energy savings of not making those proteins? Well, very roughly, 200 proteins from 100 endosymbionts. Each gene would normally produce in bacteria about 2,000 copies of the protein that it's making. Um, and on average, in bacteria, there's about 250 amino acids in a single protein. And the ATP costs are around about five ATPs per peptide bond to put two amino acids together. So we have a total of, of 50 billion ATP costs 
to make those proteins, or cost savings if we don't make those proteins. So if you put that into a 24-hour life cycle, so I'm being very conservative here by the numbers that people have been talking about earlier on, that would be 580,000 ATPs per second energy savings. What could you spend it on? Well, imagine a dynamic cytoskeleton, an actin cytoskeleton, which is one of the things that sets eukaryotes apart. What are the costs of that? Well, a monomer, so actin is made, is made a, a, a series of globular proteins which are joined together into a filament. And there's two filaments which are wrapped around each other. So the length of the monomer, the single protein, is 29 nanometers, which means just 35 of them in a micrometer. There's 374 amino acids in each of these proteins. It's a dimer, as I said, five ATPs per peptide bond. So you could make 131,000, sorry, it costs 131,000 ATPs to make one micrometer of actin, roughly, which means you could make four per second for those energy savings. And so you see that just gene loss in eukaryotes uh, from the endosymbionts produces so much superfluous energy that eukaryotes are effectively just swamped in ATP, and it makes all the difference in the world in terms of what they can do. And this, again, shows that difference. We've already seen this. This is, uh, this is now measured numbers. This is not theoretical scaling on a sphere. This is the known metabolic rate, the measured metabolic rate, the known genome size, the known polyploidy, um, and, and this is, again, it's a log scale. So this is three or four orders of magnitude difference for eudlina and for a large amoeba amoeba proteus, we have far more energy availability per gene than, than bacteria do. And again, this is a, there's an overlap. The bacteria and the archaea, this is the genome size down here, a log scale again. Where up here near the top, mammals, there's anything goes. We can support a genome as large as we want to through this method, but bacteria and archaea never really get above here. So three or four orders of magnitude difference again. It comes out exactly the same in that sense. So just to finish then, this is really, um, I would say, the defining signature of eukaryotes and something that we have to wrestle with when we're thinking about treating diseases and so on as well, is that bacteria have a kind of genomic symmetry. Each cell has a similarly sized genome controlling a similar volume of cytoplasm and a similar area of cell membrane. And so if you were to take a random walk through a population of E. coli, you would find uh, a, a kind of each cell has its similar sized genome. You'd find the same thing if you walked through the cytoplasm of Thia margarita. You'd keep finding similarly sized genomes controlling similar volumes of, uh, of, of, of cytoplasm. But if you were to do that through a population of Eudlina, you'd find a massive, massive nuclear genome uh, supported energetically by these tiny mitochondrial genomes. And so we have a genomic asymmetry. We don't have really a single human genome. There are two human genomes, and the mitochondrial genome I won't say it's as important, but the interactions between the two genomes are tremendously important to human health. So this is the final slide. Why did complex life only arose, arise once? Well, it's very difficult to get one cell inside another cell when we're talking about bacteria. We know of one example, possibly a couple of others, which are more equivocal. There must have been thousands of examples over evolutionary time. Um, so it's a bottleneck, but it's not a very effective bottleneck. But once it's got inside, we have effectively a simple bacterial cell with other bacterial cells living inside it. This is why we don't see any intermediates to work out those life cycles, to live together, to evolve all of this complexity in that common ancestor. I would say we need to be looking at the interactions between the host cell and the, and the, and the endosymbionts to explain a great deal of this complexity. And again, here we can get into standard population genetics and we can model some of these and we can make predictions and we can test these predictions, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I'm just going to stop now and say thank you very much, and thank you to many of the people.